So I'm trained as a physicist. What I do is synthesize a very broad spectrum of sciences, both physical sciences, what we sometimes call the hard sciences, but also social sciences, what I usually call the harder sciences, <laughs> and synthesize this through a lens of understanding the ongoing interactions between us, our systems of food and energy and economy, our civilization, and the critical Earth systems that make us and our civilization possible, soil, water, climate, and life. It's a field of study we call global complexity and global change and human vibrancy. And indeed, changes are ongoing. In fact, the changes are so big and so fast, the word change is really no longer appropriate. It's the word disruption that is now more accurate. And in fact, the disruptions are so large and so quick we now find ourselves in a place when we need to fundamentally re-examine what it means and what mode we humans can continue to exist on our island planet in the coming decades. So for the next hour or so, um, I'm going to tell you a story. And the story is my narrative, my understanding of what it is we now know about our island planet and about ourselves. And of course, uh, because the disruptions are so large, the term that I'm going to come back to towards the end of this is the notion of radical in terms of the mode that we need to now exist on this planet. Now, ostensibly, we're all here to talk about climate change. And we are definitely going to talk about climate change. I'm going to assume that most of you in the audience are familiar with the basic story. So I'm not going to dwell too long on the details of the science, though I will review it. But as we as a nation, and Montana as a state, and Missoula as a community, and other communities around the state, prepare, and you certainly are preparing, uh, to start taking big steps in response to this giant challenge of climate change. What I want to do is maybe give you a, a perspective into which these steps are going to fit as you move forward. So uh, I want to talk about the scale of the challenge that we're facing, the scale of the risks that we're facing, and the scale of the response that is going to be required if we are to meet this challenge. I'm then going to try to put this response into a much broader context, this broader context of global change. And that's going to be critically important. And because by the time we're done with this, we're going to say that the response that is required from us is utterly extraordinary and unprecedented, I'm going to offer a mindset that I believe such a response can emerge from. And so that's what we're going to talk about for the next hour or so. So let's start with this notion of climate disruption. And I think, as I said, we all know the story, but this is it. So here's what's happening. We are burning fossil fuels as a, a feature of our global civilization. And we are emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We're emitting other things too, but carbon dioxide is by far the most important. And these emissions we measure in gigatons, billions of tons of carbon dioxide. That's going to come back later, make a note. And then they build up in the atmosphere into concentrations of carbon dioxide molecules in the atmosphere. And the measurement for this is ppm, parts per million. So how many, million, uh, how many carbon dioxide molecules for every million other molecules in the atmosphere? And this is what that concentration looks like over the last 1,000 years. So again, we're looking at parts per million concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And you can see it's been really quite steady for the last 1,000 years, indeed for most of the last 12,000 years, at about 280 parts per million. It starts to go up over here in the end of the 18th century as the Industrial Revolution starts to gin up and continues to climb. And then as we become a fully industrialized global civilization, about the middle of the 20th century, it just spikes. All of that rise in carbon dioxide is attributable to humans. There's a chemical analysis called a, uh, an isotopic analysis that we can do that demonstrates that conclusively. Where we are today is 410, in fact, 416 parts per million. I just looked a little while ago. Uh, and so this is what's happening. Now, carbon dioxide is important because it's a greenhouse gas. And what greenhouse gases do is, because of their molecular structure, they're able to absorb 
energy that is leaving the planet in the form of light, prevent that energy from leaving, turn it into vibrations or thermal energy in the atmosphere. And we understand this process really, really well. The physics equation that tells me that a molecule of carbon dioxide will absorb a certain wavelength of light in the infrared, a color of light that we can't see, and turn that into thermal energy in the atmosphere is the exact same physics equation that allows us to construct something like this. So we understand this really well. Now, what we expect then is for the atmosphere to warm, and indeed that's happening. Here's what it looks like from the end of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th to today. Now I'm going to show this to you again in a minute, uh, but I want to make sure that you understand this is a map of temperature change, not temperature. The North Pole didn't suddenly get warmer than the equator, but it is warming up faster. So let's take a look at that one more time uh, from the end of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th to today. So as the different places on those maps go from the cooler blues to the warmer reds, they're warming up. And the deeper the red, the more the warming. And you can certainly see that the entire planet is warming, but you can also see that that warming is most definitely not uniform. Higher northern latitudes are warming faster than the rest of the planet. Land surfaces are warming faster than water surfaces. We understand why that is. But if you average up all the places on the planet, you find that we've warmed a little more than one degree Celsius in that hundred years. Most of that has come in the last 40 years. And for those of you who are metrically challenged, I understand, you can always convert a temperature change from Celsius to Fahrenheit by roughly doubling it. So that's about a two degree Fahrenheit global average temperature change. Now that doesn't sound like much. The temperature change is certainly more than that when you walk from here into the bathroom. Uh, we'll put that in context a little bit later, but for an entire planet, for this planet, that turns out to be a very large change in a very short amount of time. Now, <clears throat> I think most of us know that if you warm the atmosphere, roughly speaking, it's able to hold more moisture. Warmer air can evaporate more moisture and keep it in vapor state. And so if you warm the atmosphere, evaporation across the planet intensifies. But then when you do get a storm, you've got all this extra water up there and you get more intense precipitation events. Combined, this is called an intensification of the water cycle, the hydrologic cycle, the evaporation and the precipitation. And if they were, this were the only additional change from warming the atmosphere, it would be huge. But it's not, because everything in our Earth system is connected. And so when you change the temperature, you change everything else. So we change everything about the frozen bits on the planet, the cryosphere. This is continental ice sheets like Greenland and Antarctica. This is mountain glaciers that we have in the tropics. This is uh, frozen polar ice at the top of the world in, in the Arctic Ocean. This is tundra. Uh, frozen soil, and this is indeed snowpack like we have here in the Inner Mountain West. And not surprisingly, what's happening on a global scale is it's melting. You change the way the planet redistributes the energy, the weather patterns and the ocean currents. Here in the mid northern latitudes, the jet stream is our major storm track. This is this river of fast moving air 20,000 feet or so above us. It's created by the temperature difference between the pole and the equator, and as that temperature difference changes, it affects the jet stream. Particularly, it's slowing it down and it's making it wavier. And that's important because south of the jet stream is the warmer tropical air, north is the cooler polar air. So when it gets wavier, it, uh, when it waves up, it pulls tropical air much further north than normal. This is why Anchorage sees 50 degrees in January. And it also, when it uh, waves down, pulls polar air much further south than it normally goes, which is why South Carolina has been having particularly frigid winters the last few years. That air is not any colder than it used to be. It's just in a different place than it used to be. Instead of Nova Scotia, it's over South Carolina. So you change everything about this redistribution system. And that changes where it rains and where it doesn't, and where it snows and where it doesn't, how intense it is, the drought depths and frequencies, heat wave depths and frequencies. We change whole climate cycles in the planet, these internal cycles, the most famous of which is probably the El Nino-La Nina cycle, which is about exchanging energy between the oceans and the atmosphere. You change where things can live and where they can't, when they go dormant, when they come awake, when they migrate, what biologists call the phenology of the biosphere, the, the cycles where things can grow and where they can't. We change fundamentally lake chemistry, river chemistry, soil chemistry, ocean chemistry, sea levels. Absolutely everything changes. 
This then is what we mean by climate change. So the recap of climate change is this. We know four things with high confidence. Earth is warming. That warming is because of us. This anthropogenic, human-caused warming is disrupting the entire planetary climate system. And the fourth thing, which we're going to spend a bit more time on now, is that if we continue on our current track, it carries with it extreme risks for humans. And these four points are considered scientific knowledge. And what we mean in science when we say we know something, of course, is that this is something that is consistent with many independent lines of evidence and inconsistent with no lines of evidence. It doesn't mean that we don't refine our knowledge. That continually happens. But the chances that uh, any of these conclusions will be overturned are essentially zero. We know these things as well as we know anything scientifically. So that's the basic story. Let's then talk about the scale of these risks. I've said it carries with it extreme risks. What do we mean by that, really? We're going to talk about the scale of the risk and the scale of the response. To try to understand risk, we, can try, we try to understand what's going to happen with the climate system in the future. When we run models of the climate system, which is just applying physics, this is a temperature change model for North America under a high carbon scenario, which is the scenario we're currently following, through the end of this century. So as the different places on the map change temperature, they're warming up. Uh, this again is a high carbon scenario on the right, a low carbon scenario on the left. Under the high carbon scenario, that's about a 13 degree Fahrenheit average temperature rise across the United States by the end of this century. The darker reds towards the poles are 25 degrees or more Fahrenheit of warming by the end of the century. That's on a high carbon scenario, which we are currently following. On the left is that same period on a low carbon scenario, and it still carries with it quite significant change. Up to four degrees across most of uh, North America, that's a little more than we've already warmed. So this is still quite a bit of additional warming. And the nice thing about looking at this in this side-by-side -side fashion, I think, is don't look at this as two different models. Look at this as two different choices. As we move forward from today, we are choosing to move to the scenario on your left or the scenario on your right. Now, there's a couple of things you should know about the differences between these scenarios as you decide which one you'd like to choose. The scenario on the left carries with it very significant consequences for the planet. It will require significant, very difficult in some cases, adaptations. For some people in some places on the planet, the scenario on the left will be catastrophic. Indeed, for some people in some places on the planet, the change that we have already seen have been catastrophic. But uh, it's not expected at least to be on a global scale on the scenario on the left of catastrophic. The scenario on the right is viewed by people who look at this and try to understand the implications for it for natural systems and for human systems is indeed viewed as catastrophic. And that word in the science community is used quite specifically, meaning unadaptable. When we say catastrophic, we mean catastrophic for humans, and in particular, human civilization. No one's talking about wiping out every last human on the planet. That's pretty difficult. We are extraordinarily resilient and adaptive to very different kinds of environments. But human civilization, on the other hand, is very finely tuned to the environment in which we're in. We'll look at that in just a moment. There's certainly, there's one more thing you should know about these two scenarios. Should we follow the scenario on the left, by the latter half of this century, we can expect to be leveling off. This is as much as we can expect. It's a lot and will require significant adaptation. But the scenario on the right doesn't end here. Should we continue to follow this trajectory, we can expect the temperature rise to continue for another couple of centuries. So these are very, very different scenarios. And in fact, the, the people who study these often refer to the one on the right as moving to a new planet entirely. Humans and the human ecosystem have never known that environment on the right. In fact, we've never known the environment on the left either. Let's take a look at one more simulation. This is snowpack. Here in the Intermountain West, we know how important snowpack is. Most of us in Utah get our water from melting snowpack. This is spring snowpack. When it's ready to start melting and giving us our water, it's at its maximum. 
Uh, so here's where we're looking. The darker blues are the higher elevations, of course, the deeper snowpack. The white is the, the lower elevations, the thinner snowpack. I'm going to show you data of spring snowpack starting in 1950, and then we're going to move into projections again through a high carbon scenario, the one we're currently tracking on. And let me just see if this. So as you can see, some years are snowier than others. We know this, but we always have significant snowpack at the end of the spring. As we move in to projections, though, under, again, a high carbon scenario, we see the snowpack thinning through the middle of the century. And then as we move towards the latter part of the century, we see the snowpack essentially disappears. And this is not too hard to understand. As the temperature warms, more precipitation falls as rain instead of snow. And instead of building up in a reservoir, runs off and runs away. Soil moisture is another very important thing for us civilizationally, of course. Uh, our first thoughts go to agriculture. So I want to show you two projections. The first one is a moderate emission scenario, somewhere between low and high, sort of kind of getting religion, but not quite, very quickly. As the different places on the map go get browner, they're getting drier. As they get bluer, they're getting wetter. So we see, again, through the middle of the century, significant drying through uh, North America and Central America. Extending into Canada as we move to the last part of the century. But then again, on a moderate emission scenario towards the end of the century, this is roughly where we can expect things to start leveling off. Here's that same run on a high carbon scenario. Again, the path we're currently following. Again, significant drying through the middle of the century. And then dramatically intensified through the end of the century. And then again, Remember, this is not where it ends if we're following this path. This is just where we've cut off our simulation. Now, I haven't given you any numbers. I've given you some pretty dramatic colors. The people who study this, ranging from agricultural scientists to biologists and ecologists to social planners, refer to the scenario on your left again as dangerous, meaning requiring significant adaptations and having large impact on our society. And the society on the, and the scenario on the right again is catastrophic, again meaning unadaptable. And it's not just the obvious things that we think about, the heat and the absence of water and the inability to grow things. And in fact, where I live in northern Utah, under, uh, for soil moisture, you can find yourself in a sort of a perverse situation where you end up with maybe a little more precipitation, which is what the modeling suggests that we will receive in northern Utah, and still end up drier. Because as the temperature goes up, the evaporation intensifies. And it's not a small effect. It's what we would call a nonlinear effect, meaning you raise the temperature a little, evaporation intensifies a lot. So it's not just the obvious impacts. But um, let's imagine what happens when people can no longer grow food where they live. And we've seen what happens when just a few million people are displaced from their homes. Let's say 7 million people or so across the Middle East and North Africa in the last decade. As an enormous drought swept across Syria in the early years of this decade, this past decade, driving millions of people off the land with a giant global warming thumbprint on it, into cities in a civilization that was already stressed. The civilization collapses into civil war. It's ongoing. It's been utterly catastrophic for these people, internally displacing something like 5 million people. A couple million people get out, combined with people migrating north from uh, Africa who can no longer grow the food that they used to grow because the weather patterns are no longer reliable. And they try to make their way into Europe. And we understand the kind of political and cultural chaos that's been unleashed as a result of that. That's from a couple of million people trying to make their way uh, out of those places, these climate refugees. Uh, and now imagine what happens when such a thing as the scenario on the right happens. I can certainly picture a wall going up, maybe between Canada and the United States. <laughs> the scale of the risk, when we say is extreme, is utterly extreme. I'll give you one more example. Each of these dots is a coastal city with a population of one million or more. On the current path we're on, we can expect up to two meters of sea level rise by the end of the century. And again, if that's the path we're on, that is not where it ends or where it stops. Two meters of sea level rise will displace currently 200 million people worldwide. 
it will flood another 600 million people annually through high tides and storm surges. So we've seen the kind of social problems that are unleashed when a few million people are forcibly displaced from their homes. Now imagine tens or hundreds of millions of people trying to relocate. And we understand why the United States Department of Defense has issued a dozen reports in the last 20 years calling impacts from climate change the single largest threat to American security. So when we say extreme, we really do mean extreme. So it's things like this, and this, and this, and this, and many, many more such examples that we could put up that lead scientists like Lonnie Thompson, a very distinguished glacial, uh, glaciologist at Ohio State University, to make statements like this. This is a very common sentiment, utterly mainstream scientific opinion, not just among climate scientists, but among the many uh, kinds of physical and social scientists who study the impacts of, of these projections. Kevin Anderson is the director of the Tyndall Climate Center uh, in the United Kingdom and uh, one of the world's preeminent carbon modelers. He looks at how carbon moves through the systems and where we might change that and lower it. What he means in this statement by four degree future is a global average warming of four degrees Celsius above pre-industrial temperatures, of which, remember, we've warmed a little more than one. But he continues. Incompatible with an organized global civilization. Um, Uh-oh. What do you think, Isaac? I'm going to unplug and plug it back in. Disruption. Disruption. <laughs> OK. On cue. Well done, Isaac. Incompatible with an organized global civilization, likely to go beyond adaptation, devastating to a majority of ecosystems, and there's a high probability of not being stable. And I want to spend just a couple of more minutes on this last point. What does he mean by that? Complex physical systems like the climate system we understand to be what are called nonlinear, complex. And a better word is just twitchy. You can prod them a little, they change a little. You can prod them a little, they change a little. And if you prod them just a little too much, they change a lot, dramatically and quickly. And we know that Earth's climate system behaves this way. It is indeed the story of the last several million years of Earth's climate as we've gone from the depths of glacials to the heights of interglacials, which we're currently in. Uh, and scientists can uh, postulate and try to identify what are called thresholds or tipping points in these complex systems that are the boundaries between where they change a little or not at all and change a lot. And there are uh, about a dozen or so tipping points that we look at quite closely. One of which is just the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You remember this graph. And we find out by looking at past or paleoclimate data that the last time the Earth was above 350 parts per million in the atmosphere, for any length of time geologically, let's call it a few centuries or more, this was an ice-free planet. And sea levels were close to 200 feet higher. And so it would appear we've already crossed one potential tipping point in the climate system. And we need to get back down below 350 parts per million. Any level of risk management would suggest as quickly as we can. Now, we oftentimes use this little model to talk about um, nonlinear systems uh, and stability. So it's a little marble and a dimple. And you can see that if we displace that marble a little bit, the conditions around it tend to take it back to where it was. And that's what we would call stable, or at least conditionally stable, because if we disturb it a little too much, then it moves past a shoulder or a threshold in which the conditions around it then no longer take it back to where it was, but accelerate the changes underway and take it to a very, very different state. And again, this is in fact the story of Earth's climate system for the last four million years. The question, of course, is 
as we move to warmer and warmer temperatures, are there thresholds and tipping points that take us to dramatically different states? And the evidence suggests that probably, yes, that is true, and that quite possibly we're very close to some of those thresholds. And not just crossing one threshold, but sort of a cascade of thresholds. This is the concern. It's the story of the Titanic. For those of you who have seen this movie, it's the perfect you know, metaphor for all things catastrophic. <laughs> so they hit the iceberg. And it doesn't seem so bad, right? It's a glancing blow and some champagne glasses tip over in first class. But it doesn't seem so bad. And everybody's wiping their brow, but the, cap, the guy who built the boat is on the bridge, and he's looking at the lights, and he says, we have got to get everybody off the boat. And they said, what are you talking about? That isn't so bad. He says, no, no, no. We can stay afloat with four compartments flooded, not five. And he's looking at the lights that tell him which compartments are flooding. He says, we're flooding five compartments. We've got to get everybody off the boat. That's the threshold. Now, that didn't mean that the boat sank instantly, but he knew it was going to end up at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. It could take a few hours, which it did, but that's where it was going to go. And this is how nonlinear, twitchy systems like this behave. And this is why you want to stay away from the tipping points. And of course, we don't know what all the tipping points are. We know some of them and have some ideas. We don't know exactly what the threshold is. But in this case, when the consequences are so extreme, uncertainty is not your friend, right? How close am I <laughs> to the edge? So the uncertainty in the modeling is not a reason for inaction. The uncertainty in this is a reason for dramatically enhanced action. Because the, thrift, the thresholds are probably there. Now, uh, this graph shows you the glacial, interglacial period of the last several million years, or actually just the last 12,000 years. We pop up 12,000 years ago at the back out of the last glacial period into our current period, which is called the Holocene. This 12,000 year period of stable climate in which civilization has arisen and to which it is very finely tuned. And in the last uh, century or so, mostly in the last 40 years, we've wandered off into this no man's land over there on your right and we believe are marching towards thresholds potentially quite close. And the idea is what we want to do is get back over into our safe little Holocene dimple and not go uh, further down into this, what might be called a hothouse earth. So this is what Kevin Anderson is talking about when he says, not entirely stable. And hopefully this picture shows us that when we now talk about the impacts that we're already seeing from the changes that we've already had, the dramatically intensified precipitation events and tropical storms, think five feet of rain uh, over Houston a couple of years ago from Hurricane Harvey and many, many other such examples, the massive intensified fire seasons in uh, the west right here, to which we are all very familiar with, uh, the Australians are also becoming very familiar with, and all that that entails. And that gets called the new normal. But hopefully this scenario shows you that we are nowhere close to the new normal on our current trajectory. And that's what people like Kevin Anderson are looking at when they make statements like this. And again, this is an absolutely mainstream statement from the people who study these systems. So that's the scale of the risk. When we say extreme, we mean extreme. The scale of the response, hopefully, is what's running through your mind now, what we do. And at the highest level, the physics equation for this is really very simple. More carbon equals more risk. If you can identify what you think is a, a danger line, and, and there's a lot of, of um, this is problematic, no question. Because again, there are people already on the planet who have already experienced catastrophic impacts from the changes we've seen, but they have been regional and localized. The notion is at what point does that start to become global, where it's happening everywhere all the time? So for 30 years, uh, the scientists who studied this identified about two degrees Celsius as a danger line of global average warming, again, of which we've already done one, and said we want to stay below that. And so once you identify a danger line, you can identify a carbon budget. You can calculate that. How much more carbon do we think we can throw up in the atmosphere and stay below that line? So here's that budget for a two degree danger line as done by a massive modeling study, global modeling study in 2012. About 1,000 gigatons, 1,000 billion tons of more carbon we could throw up in 20, starting in 2012. 
and hopefully stay below two degrees Celsius. And this is for a, for a two-thirds chance of staying below, which I don't find particularly aggressive risk management given the consequences. This is two bullets in a six-shooter playing Russian roulette. I don't think anyone in the room here would pull that trigger. Nevertheless, that's the parameters of the study, and there's the budget. And of course, uh, we've been burning through that budget. As of 2018, this is where we stood with that budget. But also, as of 2018, we started to understand that the Earth was retaining quite a bit more energy than we thought it was. And that energy was being squirreled away in the deeper oceans. Harder to find, but we found it. And so that suggests that uh, the carbon budget is lower. We don't want to, we've been retaining more energy, and so that changes the equation by about 25%. Also, uh, at this time, though, we've discovered that over the last decade, the impacts from the changes we've already seen to both natural and human systems have been piling up bigger and faster than were expected even a decade ago. And so maybe we need to recalibrate and say two degrees really might not be the danger line, more like one and a half degrees. So we change it to one and a half degrees, and of course our budget gets smaller. And that was in 2018, and we've been burning through ever since. And here's our budget as of last month. To the best of our scientific ability to discern, we cannot burn any more than this and hope to stay below this danger line. And here's how fast we're going to burn through that budget. About a decade. And this is a very easy calculation. Here's that budget relative to the traditional coal and oil and natural gas reserves that are underground that we are currently exploiting. We found them and we're extracting them. So what the physics tells us, and this is physics. This isn't right or left or conservative or progressive. This is just physics. Tells us that we can burn roughly 10% of, of the traditional reserves that we're already exploiting. And if we include the non-traditional reserves, things uh, fields that need to be fracked, or tar sands, which we should include because we are exploiting them. Of course, the reserves are much larger. And the physics tells us we can burn something on the order of 5% of that. Any meaningful level of risk management says that's our budget. That's the physics. That's the deal. So meeting that budget, what would that look like? Here's a graph of emissions going back to 1990. So this is gigatons of carbon dioxide on the left. In 1990, we burned about 20 gigatons. Over here in about in 2018, we burned almost 40 gigatons globally, threw it up in the atmosphere. And it goes up and up and up. If we are to meet that budget, if we are to not exceed the budget I just showed you here, of course, is what has to happen. We have to peak and we have to decline. We have to be down to zero as quickly as we can, no later than the middle of this century. As long as the emissions are not zero, the concentrations in the atmosphere continue to increase and the warming and the climate change continues. So even after we peak and the emissions are going down, should we be able to do that, climate change continues until those emissions hit zero. This then, to do this, is big. If we had tried to do it, started 30 years ago when we absolutely knew that we needed to do this, and in fact, George H.W. Bush stood on the White House lawn and made the pronouncement, we are going to meet this challenge of the greenhouse effect. Does anybody know what he was, remember the rest of the line? We will meet this challenge of the greenhouse effect with the White House effect. <laughs> so in 1990, in a very bipartisan way, our nation was on board. We need to fix this. We understood it 30 years ago. In that time, our global emissions and our national emissions have doubled. And so now, what would have been almost trivial had we started in 1990 becomes, frankly, almost impossible today. The scale of the change that's required is enormous. Some people would call this a radical decarbonization, I call it a rational decarbonization. It is radical in the sense that it's large, but we often use that term radical to mean extreme, uh, to mean irrationally extreme, right, crazy. And in that sense, this is not radical, this is rational, or perhaps rationally radical. So what is that, uh, what is that gonna look like? The next 10 years, this is where we're headed 
on our current trajectory by 2030. If every nation who has signed on to the Paris Climate Accords adheres to their commitments, and that is every nation on the planet except the United States, then this is where we will be in the next 10 years. And if we are to meet the budget that I showed you, this is where we need to be. So clearly, the Paris Accord is not enough. But it's worth pointing out, it was never, ever intended to be. It was always intended to be turning the ship, and then you want to build momentum from there. But clearly, even the Paris Accord is nowhere close to what we need. If you uh, integrate under that line for the math nerds in the class, that's the budget. That gives you total emissions. And so you can see then, if the line goes up for a little longer, then we burn more carbon up front, and we have to make it up on the back end. And again, had we started 30 years ago, it would have been almost trivial to do this. But now, every year we delay in peaking and starting down, it gets a lot harder. The decline has to be that much faster. If we were to do it, though, what would it look like? Let's look at this decline. The basic rule of thumb is we need to cut our emissions in half globally every decade for the next several decades. The next decade is by far the most important any of us will ever live through. The next decade is by far the most important. That means globally about a 7% annual decline. We've never come anywhere close to that. Last year, global emissions went up uh, something on the order of 2%, plus or minus a little. In the United States, also, plus or minus, call it 2%. Now, there's a catch. <laughs> of course, there's a catch. Right? Not everybody is equally responsible for the predicament we're in, and not everybody uh, has equal capability for meeting the challenge that is in front of us. 10% of the world's population is responsible for 50% of our material and energy consumption. In other words, 10% of the world's population is responsible for about 50% of the world's emissions. And, and that top 10% emits a lot. If that top 10% of the world's emitters were to cut their emissions footprint to the level of the average European citizen. This is not an ascetic level. The average European citizen, for whom most social outcomes are better than those of, for those of us in the United States, that would cut our global emissions by a third, just by reducing, taking that 10% and taking it down to a reasonable level, the average European citizen. 20% of the world's population is responsible for 80% of our material and energy throughput and consumption, therefore emissions. If the top 1% of the emitters in the United States, that's about 3.5 million people, let's compare that to the bottom 1% of the planet emitters, about 75 million people. We find out that this 3.5 million people emits 2,500 times as much as that 75 million people. In other words, we would need 188 billion of these people to equal the current emissions of these people. There's a lot of slush at the top. There's a lot of room to cut without cutting quality of life, a huge amount. So when you plug that back into what we need to do globally, is it perhaps is it really fair to, to ask Sri Lanka or Bangladesh or Sudan or Nigeria to cut their emissions 7% annually? They did not create the problem that we've got. And they don't have the means and the wealth derived from all of this high carbon emissions that we have to meet this challenge. They're just trying to turn the lights on. So when you include any reasonable notion of social justice, that means that really for the developed nations, we need to be cutting our emissions more like 15% a year. The next 10 years are critical. We don't have 10 years to solve it. We've got to get on this now. That's just the physics. So we need to bend the emissions curve now. We need to uh, have our emissions every decade until we get to zero. 
For the developed nations, that means 15% annual decline. And this is applicable at any scale. And this is important because you're all sitting there, I know, thinking, OK, what do I do? Hopefully some of you are thinking that. <laughs> and that brings into notion this notion of individuals addressing this problem. So what I mean by any scale is the household scale, the community scale, the university scale, the state scale, the national scale, 15%. Now, so can you personally reduce your emissions 15% this year? For most of us in this room, it's almost trivial. Can you eat 15% less animal products? That's important because industrial agriculture is responsible for between a quarter and a third of our emissions. For most of us in this room, how we eat is one of the biggest pieces of our emissions footprint. So can you reduce the amount of animal products you eat by 15% this year? Can you drive 15% fewer miles? Can you fly 15% fewer miles? Most of us in this room can do that without hardly thinking. But then you have to do it again next year. And then you have to do it again the year after that. And each year it gets harder and harder. And the reason it gets harder and harder is because the systems that we are embedded in fight us. These are systemic problems and they're not going to be solved by individuals, solely by individuals changing their behavior. Ultimately, Oh, we need to change our behavior. <laughs> but it does not take us to where we need to go. We need to change the systems. Let me give you one example. If we were to take that budget I showed you, that carbon budget, divide it up among everybody in the planet, 7.5 billion people, everybody gets their personal carbon budget. It's 44 tons for the rest of their lives. Here's your budget, 44 tons. Sri Lankans will never burn through that budget. Americans will burn through that budget in about two and a half years, each American, on average. The high emitters, of course, in a few days. So now imagine you go home and you say, I am gonna, I'm going to do everything I can. And you turn off your lights, you turn off your gas, you never turn on the heat or the air conditioning, you never set foot in another car or bus. Uh, you go down into your basement and you just decompose on some garden seeds. <laughs> If I, I didn't look it up for Montana, I suspect it's very similar. In Utah, your budget would drop from about, 19, or your emissions footprint would drop from about 19 tons per year to about six tons per year. In other words, just existing in that society, you have a footprint, a personal footprint of six tons per year. It's all the infrastructure, it's the way we run our society. So put another way, if you live this impossible ascetic life, you will, not, you will change the amount of time you need to burn through your footprint from about two or two and a half years to about six or seven years. It just doesn't buy us very much. You've got to change the systems that have that, that embedded, in, the, in our case, six ton footprint. So yes, do we need to take personal actions? Absolutely, because as we move forward and transform systems, that's gonna be involved. But what we need to do is plug ourselves into efforts that transform systems, and there are many such efforts. So that's climate change. And any sensible speaker would stop right now. <laughs> but I'm going to continue. So the scale of the risk is enormous. The scale of the response is enormous. And let's be clear, it's not entirely clear we can do that at all. To the extent that this is a technological problem, it is utterly viable. We have the technology and the knowledge we need. It is almost entirely a cultural problem at this point. But that cultural problem fits into a larger context. So don't try to read these graphs. I apologize for the visual assault. Just look at the shapes going from small to high on the right. These are trends in the Earth system. Think of it in our life support system. We just talked about the carbon dioxide trend uh, spiking. And I just want you to notice where the, where the spike really starts to happen is roughly about the middle of the 20th century. The nitrous oxide and methane are other very important greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We're fundamentally changing the chemistry of the atmosphere. And it's a nonlinear change. It's really spiking starting in about the middle of the 20th century. 
And that's true for our impacts on the oceans. Uh, further in the atmosphere, our extractions of, uh, of biota from the oceans. Nitrogen to coastal zones is coming from agriculture. This is causing huge dead zones in the ocean, so-called so eutrophication, depletion of oxygen. But just look at the shape. Land systems are being affected similarly. The documentation to this is extraordinary in reports like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the WWF Living Planet Report, the National Climate Assessment, the Global Footprint Network synthesize thousands and thousands of studies through this lens to understand what is happening to the natural world. Here's what's happening to the biosphere. In the last four decades, humans have wiped out approximately 60% of the living creatures on the planet. Ecologists tell us that the extinction rate is now a factor of 100 to a factor of 1,000 times elevated above the expected background extinction rate. We're losing species at a rate of something like 20 to 60 a day. Habitat destruction is what is causing this. Seabird populations in the last 50 years down 70%. Elephants down 70%. Lions, 90%. Large fish, 90%. Sharks are down 95%. The list goes on and on and on. And that's from destruction of habitat. This is not from climate change. Primarily, this being the exception. From 2015 to 2017, in a very strong ocean warming event, marine biologists tell us we lost something on the order of 20% of the world's coral reefs. If we go to two degrees Celsius of global average warming, the marine biologists and ecologists tell us we can expect to lose all of the world's coral reefs. These are the tropical rainforests of the oceans, home to a quarter to a third of the ocean species. An ocean system without coral reefs is fundamentally transformed. Insects, over a three-year period in Europe, they've lost 75% of the flying insects. More than 90% over a 40, uh, of a four-decade period in the Caribbean, in Puerto Rico. The impacts to the biosphere are extraordinary. What's causing that? Think of this, and again, look at the shapes of the graphs. Think of this as people system trends. And look at where the explosions happen. Again, in the middle of the 20th century, real GDP, think of that as a proxy for material and energy throughput, our extraction and excretion. Foreign direct investment is a proxy for globalization. How globalized is this system becoming? And the shapes of the curves of consumption on all kinds are the same, again exploding in about the middle of the 20th century. So why am I showing you all of this? This is a feature that people who study this, global change, call the great acceleration. And it's critical to understand in our culture if we were to fully grasp that this is real. Because what happens when people like me go on television, I actually have never been on television, <laughs> and say the things I'm saying, the, net, the, the other guest that they invite on says, well, well environmentalists, and, uh, chicken little, and crying doom, and it's all going to hell, and it's never happened. They always say that we're going to collapse, and we never do. Um, something has fundamentally changed, starting in about the middle of the 20th century. We've gone to, and often the phrasing is, uh, a small world on a big planet to a big world on a small planet. What that means is a small world on a big planet is when the human metabolism, our extraction and consumption and excretion of wastes into the environment, was small compared to the Earth system flows themselves. But now we've gone to a place where we are a big world on a small planet. The human uh, metabolism is now on par with the Earth system itself, the flow, the natural flows of these things. And so that's fundamentally changed. This isn't um, chicken Little, this isn't Thomas Malthus calling Chicken Little in the 18th century. We're a fundamentally different world now. These are the symptoms. Climate change is one of them, but there are others. They're not the problems. These are the causes. And it leads to statements like this in the 
uh, this from the, a recent issue of the prestigious scientific journal Nature. If you're reading that and thinking it doesn't sound good, it's exactly as bad as it sounds. And it has led the world's geologists to rechristen our current geologic epoch, the Anthropocene. They mean that quite technically accurately. Humans are now the single largest driver of change on the surface of the planet, the age of humans. Okay. So the pathology that is leading to these symptoms is us, the way we have organized ourselves. And it centers on this one notion of growth. So I've colored in a few pixels up there. You see the black square? If I were to add another black square just like that every second, this is called arithmetic growth. I just add another one of those squares every second. It would take me 10 and a half hours to fill up this screen. I did the math. <laughs> However, if I were to move to exponential growth, which means a continuous rate of growth, it's a different story. So if my rate of growth is 100% every second, I'm going to double this every second. I put it up there in the top corner there. Let's see how long it takes. One, two, three, four. Fifteen seconds. Now, if instead of doubling that every second, if the growth rate on that square was three or three and a half percent, every year, the doubling time would be about 20 years, in which case it would have taken about 300 years to fill up that piece of the screen. And then how much more time to fill up the other half? One more doubling, 20 more years. And this is the insidious nature of exponential growth. Three or three and a half percent is what the economists tell us we need to grow our economy, which is our material and energy throughput very tightly tied to thrive. That's what they tell us. That's what they go to Davos and plot and scheme. How do we do this? Three and a half percent every year. Now, look at what this does. We do that for long periods of time and we say, oh my God, we've been doing this, let's say, for a century. Let's say that the whole screen is all of what Earth has to offer us, what we can consume. We do this for, say, 300 years and we look out and we say, we've still got half the planet left. We've been doing this for centuries. We've got half the planet left. And then how long to use up that other half, 20 more years? Now, the economists will dismiss this. They'll say this notion of a finite world is nonsense. They use one word to dismiss this. Anyone know what it is? Innovation. We will innovate our way out of this. The Stone Age, they tell us, did not end because we ran out of stones. <laughs> I'm quite certain that phrase is in just about every Econ 101 text. That may have had some validity, again, when we were a small world on a big planet, although it is true that civilizations outgrew their local and regional resources to catastrophic results, but it wasn't global. But now we're a big world on a small planet. And there is no physical reason to believe that we can exceed the planet's resources. But for a moment, let's grant the economists their dream and say, yes, we, can, we somehow we have innovated our way to three more planets worth of resources overnight. There is no physical reason to believe this is at all possible. But let's say we did it. There they are. Three and a half percent growth. How much to burn through the next planet? 20 years. 3.5% growth. Now we've burned through two planets. How much time to burn through the other two planets? 20 more years. So we did the absolute fantastical, physically impossible thing and found ourselves three more planets worth of resources and it bought us a few decades. At our current rate of consumption, humans are over-consuming our resource base at about 160%. Uh, this was a couple of years ago, 1.6 planets were needed to sustain our current level of consumption. Now, you can do that for a while, right? You can spend more than you make if you've got a bank account. But you draw it down, and eventually, you run into big problems. 
And of course, uh, that continues to rise as of a couple of years ago now. We're at 1.7 planets worth of overconsumption. And here's what the neoclassical economic world that absolutely rules our society and the way we live on this planet tells us is that we must grow 3.5% annually to thrive. In physics speak, what that means is on purpose, our intent is to be overconsuming our resource base by more than three planets in two decades and six planets in four decades. And what the science of complex systems tells us very strongly is the chances we ever get to this level of overshoot are essentially zero. This economic paradigm will change. The wheels are going to start coming off the cart. And we can put a cap on it. I'm not talking about centuries from now. And this is, forget, this is nothing to do with climate change. Fix climate change tomorrow, this graph doesn't change. Now, of course, climate change is emerging from the same systems that are doing, responsible for this hyperconsumption, the way that we have organized ourselves. If everyone on the planet consumed at the rate that those of us in this room consume, we would currently need between four and five planets to sustain us. Remember, not everybody needs the same number of planets as others. Some of us need more. OK, so we talked about climate change. And that seemed, it's a pretty rough discussion. I don't mean to make light of it. You've got to throw in a little humor where you can. But we didn't stop. We kept going, right? And you're thinking to yourself, Rob, why did you tell us this? Right? <laughs> it's important as we move forward with climate change to understand that climate change is not a problem. It is a symptom. There are other very large symptoms. And the responses that we move forward with climate change are, which is probably the most acute problem that we face, symptom. Because if you cross thresholds in the climate system, it's very difficult to imagine coming back to any kind of a climate state we understand on any kind of a human time frame. So we've got to avoid those thresholds at all costs. But there are other large problems. And so as we move forward with our steps, we want to make sure that those steps synergistically help us with these other problems. We want to address the, pro the, the challenges as far down the ladder as we can at the, at the source. And now we see the source. And forget climate change. We need to transform the systems that are doing this anyway. In fact, the systems that are doing this, this is the good news, are definitely going away, as we can see. But what we're, the question is hard landing or soft. We don't want them to collapse. We want them to transform in a way that we want them to transform. So the climate change challenge seems almost intractable. But there's this great, great quote from Dwight Eisenhower that I think is appropriate. And what he meant by this is that if you're not finding a way through the challenge that you're facing, you're probably not including all of the pieces. And what I've tried to do, you just not, do just now is to show us all the pieces. This is not a question of replacing coal-fired power plants with solar panels. That's just replacing one component with another in the same system. If we green all of our energy tomorrow, what are we going to do with all that energy? Same thing we've been doing with the dirty energy. Hyper-consuming, hyper-extracting, hyper-polluting. Everything has to transform. And once we understand this, it opens up doors that we hadn't thought to open before. This helps us. So you start to see the scale of the risks and the response are extraordinary. And it's kind of, it is very much hard to imagine how we get to the top of this particular mountain. It's not entirely clear that we can, as I said. Um, so let's talk about a mindset that if we are to navigate this land state from which such a response might emerge. And the mindset is this. We need to take the mindset of the actual situation we're in, which is an emergency. And again, like we scientists tend to do, we're trying to use the term very technically accurately. 
An emergency is a situation that requires immediate response to prevent catastrophic outcomes. And that is exactly where we are. If we assume this planetary mindset framework, it opens up a number of different avenues of thinking. And I'll focus, I'll end with just these three. The first is we've circled back to this notion of radical. Let's first talk about what isn't radical, using the term, again, in the pejorative sense, kind of irrational and crazy. Here's what's not radical. Knowing about a crisis and responding to it. People and institutions that know and respond are not radical. What is radical is knowing and not responding. And so the argument that I think many of us now make, and certainly speaks to me, is this, is that the radicals in the climate change discussion are not those who, would, who simply refuse to acknowledge the problem. They're just rocks sitting there. We have to step around. The radicals are those who understand the problem and still refuse to respond appropriately. And now, I apologize, that includes all of you in this room. You know now. This is radical. This is radical, given what we know. Extreme industrial pollution, this is radical. This is radical. This is radical. Not radical. Now, the United Kingdom is nowhere close to responding in a manner that's appropriate, but naming it what it is is not radical. Last October, the youth movement strike called on adults to join them, walk off their jobs across the globe. Seven million people walked off their jobs and out of classes, demanding that our societies and our governments and our representatives respond in an appropriate fashion. This is not radical. This is necessary. The second avenue of thinking that changes when we move into a, a mindset, emerg uh, an emergency mindset, is the notion of viable versus necessary. When you're in an emergency, viable is not your guiding star. Our guiding star in an emergency is what is necessary. I'm in a burning house. What is necessary to get me out? So the mindset of an emergency changes the notion of viable. We talk about, is, is this viable to do? Mostly what we mean is politically viable. As I mentioned, to the extent that we need technology, everything we need to do is technologically viable. That's already given. I'm not saying there aren't challenges to be overcome, but they're not that big. So let me ask a question. How many people in the room, if I were to say, uh, this month we need to ban, outlaw, the manufacture and sale of new automobiles? Does anybody in this room see this as politically viable? <laughs> we did it. December 1941. Congress passed a law outlawing the manufacture and sale of new automobiles. The president signed it. They said, Ford, GM, you're making tanks, you're making airplanes, you're making munitions, trucks, jeeps, everything we need to meet this emergency of World War II. We did this. What was unthinkable two months before was done two months later. Because it was possible. And the mindset of an emergency changes what we think of as viable. We need to ground all the airplanes now, tell the people to get off, find their own way home, and we can never fly again. <laughs> Politically viable? We did it. September 11th, 2001. How many in this room who were actually adults on September 11th, 2001, could even imagine that such a thing as the current TSA would be politically viable prior to that event. Now it's done. We don't even, we don't even think about it anymore. So notions like 100% renewable energy, 
technologically viable, no problem. Should be politically viable. Mostly plant-based diets, high-speed rail. In Utah, 75% of the population lives in a 100-mile stretch along the Wasatch Front. We have no trains. It's ridiculous. Putting a price on carbon, absolutely essential. Doesn't take us to where we need to go, but it's an essential step. We have to keep the fossils in the ground. This is what's... This isn't politics. This is just physics. This is what's necessary. And making it viable is just one step along the way. That's just another step. That's the mindset of an emergency. Our goal as a civilization, we currently have none. We're just stumbling into the desert. <laughs> um, many who study this and work on these things suggest the following. A sustainable and just and vibrant space for humanity on the planet as our organizing principle, as our goal. And it's important that it be just and vibrant. There are many sustainable states for humans on this planet. Most of them are not pleasant. We will be sustainable. By definition, at some point, we will be sustainable. But most of those sustainable states are not pleasant. We want it to be vibrant, right? And we have roadmaps to do this. So this notion of hope versus despair and achievement and sacrifice, then, I say this. <laughs> I have no hope to offer. I'm not here with a hopeful message. I also have no despair to offer. It's the wrong framing for an emergency. You don't hope you get out of a burning house, we just get out. Or we die trying. But we don't waste time hoping or despairing. We just get out. We, and the way you do it is you take the next step. What's the next step? If we are to get out of this thing, what's the next step? And there are many next steps that have been identified and that people are trying to take. We identify the next step. It's not hope for this is despair, it is resolve. So this guy, of course, most of you recognize, very complicated figure in history for all kinds of reasons. But we know how World War II went. And in 1940, the Chamberlain government had resigned. For four years, they had been uh, appeasing the Nazi regime. That's probably the right word. In 1936, Churchill gave a speech saying, you can't do this. We are entering a period of consequences. But of course, the Chamberlain government continued to do that. And by 1940, those consequences had accrued, and Chamberlain's government quit and handed the mess to Churchill. A German invasion was days or maybe weeks away. Europe was gone. The, German ex the British expeditionary force of 350,000 soldiers was about to be wiped out on the beaches of Dunkirk. There was no way to get to them. The Chamberlain government had even opened surrender talks with the Nazis, secretly through the Europeans or through the Italians. And they hand this mess to Churchill. It was, in fact, in a hope-despair framework, utterly hopeless. And Churchill gets on the radio. And this is this famous speech, right? We shall fight them on the beaches. And we shall fight them in the hills. And we shall fight them on the landing fields and in the cities. And we shall never surrender. And we shall never surrender. And we shall never surrender. When I listen to that, I do not hear despair. And I do not hear hope. I hear absolute unwavering resolve and commitment. He identified the next step. What's the next step? Get the troops off of Dunkirk. They did it. And watch the movie, right? <laughs> What's the next step? Get the Americans involved. They did it. What's the next step? What's the next step? What's the next step? Utter resolve. Not hope, not despair. And that is from an emergency mindset. And that is what we need. At the risk of flogging a dead horse, I'll give you one more example. American history, um, Apollo 13. To remind you, it has launched. It's on its way to the moon. There are two pieces to the spacecraft, the command module, where the astronauts sort of live. When they get to the moon, they, two of them move into the lunar module. They land. They come back up. They get back into the command module. They dump the lunar module, and the command module takes them home. You're going to hear those terms. But on the way to the moon, there's an explosion. And lots of systems are damaged. And the, and the guys back in, and they were all guys, back in mission control, you know, the demographics of aerospace engineers in 1970, 
uh, are trying to figure this thing out. And at the moment, the, the life support systems are dying and they're trying to figure this out. So here's a clip from the movie Apollo 13. So you're telling me you can only give our guys 45 hours? That brings them to about there. Gentlemen, that's not acceptable. So the regime, the regime, the regime, you gotta talk about power here. Whoa, whoa, guys, power is everything. Power is everything. Without it, they don't talk to us, they don't correct their trajectory, they don't turn the heat shield around. We gotta turn everything off. We gotta turn everything off. Now. Now. They're not gonna make it to re-entry. What do you mean everything? With everything on, the LEM draws 60 amps. At that rate, in 16 hours, the batteries are dead, not 45. And so's the crew. We gotta get them down to 12 amps. Oh, 12 12 amps. amps. How many are running? You can't run a vacuum cleaner on 12 amps, John. We gotta turn off the We have to turn off the radars, cabin heater, instrument displays, the guidance computer, the whole smack. Whoa, guidance computer? What if they need to do another burn? Gene, they won't even know which way they're pointed. The more time we talk down here, the more juice they waste up there. I've been looking at the data for the past hour. That's the deal? That's the deal. That's the deal. Okay, John. And then we finish the burn, we'll power down the line. All right. Now, in the meantime, we're going to have a frozen command module up here. In a couple days, we're going to have to power it up, use nothing but the reentry batteries. Yeah, we've been tried before. Hell, we've never even simulated it before, Gene. Well, we're going to have to figure it out. Well, we're going to have to figure it out. Absolute commitment. There's no hope in that room. There's no despair in that room. It's just utter commitment. And they figured it out. We're not going to see every step to the top of the mountain, but we can see next steps. And I don't mean to make light of the fact that this is really difficult information, and I apologize. There's grieving that has to be done, and we can feel like we're in despair, and that requires self-care and rejuvenation. But we need to get ourselves there. We need to be cathedral builders. The cathedrals in Europe were built over generations. The people who laid the foundations never saw them completed. They just believed that they will take the next step and then the next steps will happen and then the next steps will happen. We want hope. I understand that. And I don't mean to demean that. Of course hope is a part of the equation, but hope isn't free. If we want hope, we act. Hope comes from the action, not the other way around. <clears throat> We have an enormous opportunity, and here's what it is. We've lost a lot. We're going to lose a lot more. But there's a lot that can still be saved. There is a lot that can still be saved. And we get to choose. We've got to make that choice. Thank you all for your attention. Stay with us for a few minutes if you can. We know there are many questions out there in a huge audience like this, which thank you for being a huge audience. Um, we don't have the capacity to have one by one questions. Um, but again, Dr. Davies will be here and we will have some opportunity to ask some one on one questions. We have questions we can ask each other. We can continue this conversation. Um, but get back out here. <laughs> You're not done. <laughs> No, he's got one. I've got, I've got my he's mic. He's got his. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. But we, will, uh, we were uh, sitting there as enthralled as you folks were. We have just uh, a couple questions that we would like to ask. And then we will, um, again, hear a little bit more from some of the things that are happening in our community. Thank you. Am I on? Am I on? I'm on. Um, and I read the question I was supposed to ask, and I can't remember it. <laughs> um, uh, but I think the gist of it is, uh, well, first of all, thank you. Um, and I also want to take a, a brief opportunity. Um, Gwen earlier uh, thanked Amy for her efforts. 
And Amy very graciously and generously said that uh, we uh, helped bring uh, Dr. Davies here. Uh, Dr. Davies would not be here this evening if it weren't for Amy's leadership and tenacity. A lot of us helped. So. I think the gist of the question I want to ask, because I think it's on a, a lot of folks' mind, is um, you, you, you talked about a number of ways to sort of plug in. Do you have any suggestions locally here, Montana, in any community uh, for, for next steps for people, uh, how to engage? Um, uh, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah, right. It's, I mean, it's a wonderful question. It's, it's the very next thing we need to be asking. So what can you do immediately? I think many of you are probably already doing this. If you're not, it's time to start. And that is talk about this issue. Imagine Pearl Harbor was yesterday and nobody was talking about it. We're not going to uh, get to the place we want to be unless we can envision it. And we're not going to envision it unless we're talking about it. And we've got to force this conversation um, politely, but firmly and aggressively. This is not a passive sort of a thing with our friends, with our family, with our colleagues, with our employers, with our certainly with our policymakers. So, you can start talking about it immediately. Hopefully, also, what the context shows is that whoever you are, and whatever your interests, and whatever your talents, and whatever your means, and whatever your capacity, there is work for you to do. If you want to be a chef, or a farmer, or an architect, or a lawyer, or a banker, uh, or an artist, I think the biggest work right now is the storytelling. We've got to connect with this culturally. And I think I give a pretty good science lecture. But it's not this kind of lecture that's going to convert an entire society. Think of the 60s and who was connecting us to those changes. It was 19-year-old musicians and filmmakers and, and, and writers. And so um, whatever your interests, there is work for you to do, particularly if you're in the humanities and the cultural world. And we have to put humans at the, f at the forefront of this. So there are many things to plug yourselves into. I'm not going to give you a particular organization. Um, uh, Amy's been telling you about the local organizations and the efforts. I will say this, before you go off on your own and start your own crusade to change a system, which is good, fine, I like the impetus, find out what else is already happening. Usually it's best to plug yourself into something that's already going, and it can be very local, and it can be or much larger than that. So that's my, go use the Google, figure out what you want to plug yourself into. I promise you, you'll find it. Yeah. Uh a question that came to me as we were there, um, how do you, maybe it's a personal question, how do you personally keep the resolve? You know, that's a great question. I, I'm on Twitter, and most of the people I follow are sort of do the similar kinds of work that I do through all kinds of disciplines. Lots of them are, are, are in economics and finance and, and then sciences as well. The conversation about sort of self-care and um, mental health is really big in the community I work in about this, and also the notion of grieving. Joanna Macy, for those of you who know who that is, um, speaks incredibly eloquently about the need to grieve. If you watch the fires that are unfolding in, in Australia and take in what's actually happening to the natural systems and also the human systems, it's almost too much to bear. And we, uh, she makes the important point that it's important to face that. So I certainly make an active effort to, to grieve and to take a day off. And for me, that means doing things like going into the mountains, taking a backcountry ski or a trail run, just time to envelop myself in that, one of those things that inspires me. And I think for people who live in places like this often inspires many of you. And just take the day off and, and decompress and then let the sap rise again another day. Um, so the other thing I've learned is to try not to bite off too much. The, the beauty of community is that we don't all have to do everything. Work on what gives you joy to work on, and that's what I do. Um, and there are lots of things I say no to. I can't be a part of this campaign or that effort. I just don't have the time and I don't have the mental space and the emotional space. And so I've learned to trust in the other members of my community. There are other people who are working on other things. I support them in ways that I can. Of course, we all would do that. But um, don't try to do everything but most definitely try to do something. Thank you. We appreciate that. How about another round for uh, Dr. Abdi? So, 
so in these final minutes, we have a few words, uh, again, from Brian Von Lossberg, our president of the city council, about some of the local efforts here, um, and then also from Dave Strohmeyer, um, our county commissioner. So I'm going to hand